Welcome to the CG Pro podcast. Um, please feel free to subscribe for future updates. Um, we do this about every couple of weeks. Um, we also run classes. If anyone's interested in that, check out becomecgpro.com. Um, all of the admin stuff out of the way. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome John Kinnis. He is a, a prolific storyteller, um, amazing artist in his own right. Um, a lot of you may have heard of him already, been part of his Facebook group, The Real-Time Filmmakers. Um, John has a, an amazing career spanning multiple industries and genres, having come through, through games, being successful in games and writing some well-known games in the past and moving through into uh, other forms of content, movies, and um, most recently um, getting very involved in the world of real-time visual effects um, without uh, mentioning any particular projects. I know that you, you've um, created the David Bowie real-time experience, which is amazing. I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. If it, feel free to fill in any gaps if you want to mention anything particular that you've worked on. But yeah. thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it's a great My pleasure, pleasure to have you. Yeah. Um, well, thank, thanks for inviting me on. Uh, we've been talking for a few months now, and I've been uh, uh, enjoying and admiring your developments with, with your own work, and the podcast is just adding to that. So um, I'm very happy to come and, and, and talk about um, the industry, where we're at, what, where things are going. Um, Amazing. Yeah, and, thanks for joining us. Yeah, maybe you could start by kind of talking a little bit about where where this began for you, back to kind of early, you know, early career, early inspirations. Did anything kind of speak out to you uh, when you were a kid and make you feel like you know this was really calling you? Well, you know, considering you're working in you know computer graphics and technology and game engines. Uh, and, uh, and the like, but that's not where I started out. Um, and I never really envisaged this was where it would go to, but I'm, I'm very happy that it, that it has led me uh, down this path. So I, my, I was, I, I love movies. I was really into movies. I did my undergrad uh, at a college called Goldsmiths College in London. Um, and there, you know, I, I did a degree in communication studies and sociology. And part of that was making, doing movies and video production and all that, all that good stuff. And, and I was actually at Goldsmiths um, in the same year as a filmmaker called Steve McQueen, uh, which you may have heard of, who uh, you know did uh, Twelve Years a Slave and, and all of that, winning Oscars. And so Amazing. it's it's sort of very strange to think, you know, where he was at then doing very sort of fine art kind of movies. Uh, you know, that twenty years later he would be, he would be picking up Oscars for his his movie. Um, you know, and. Uh, and I and I would be writing the, the biggest video game on the planet, which was Call of Duty. So, um, you know, thinking back to the Goldsmiths Film Department back then in the in the early '90s, I never would have projected forwards to thinking, okay, that that's what would happen. So, um, you know, I think there's a useful lesson there. Like, you know, whatever plan you've got, it's probably not going to happen the way you you sort of planned it. But, um, you know, if you're passionate about something, it's going to lead you lead you to somewhere um, um, pretty cool. And so in jumping forwards, I, I, you know, as you may hear from my English accent, um, I'm based in LA. Um, I've been in LA for the last, I don't know, like 17 years or so. Um, I initially came out here on the back of a scholarship to do a master's degree, um, finish up my master's degree in screenwriting at, uh, at UCLA and the MFA program. And, uh, and I ended up staying here because uh, I thought, well, this is the place to be. Um, and as I said, my whole, my whole uh, background was in screenwriting, storytelling. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, was, I was writing a lot, you know, trying to, trying to uh, break into writing. Um, and then I, I wrote a script that won the Nicole. Now, the, the Nicole... The Academy of Nicole is, is the, the biggest screenwriting competition in the world. It's run through the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the, the Oscars. And so in 2011, I think, 2011, 2012, um, I was fortunate enough to, to win the Nicole, um, which um, was, was a pretty cool thing to do. Um, uh, you know, there's a, people like um, 
uh, Destin uh, Creighton and Andrew Lanham, who just who just uh, write a director on uh, Shang Chi recently. Um, um, Aaron Kruger, who's written all the you know the Ring movies. I mean, so it, it, it's a there's a lot of cool people who have won the Nicol before. So I was I was very honoured uh, and pleased to join that. Um, and you know the industry, you know, I was able to get repped by ICM and Brillstein. It's sort of something that the industry can kind of like, ah, oh, he won the Nicol, so you know now we can right. give him jobs and stuff. And I don't know by chance or luck or whatever it was, I I don't know. Um, the uh, producers of Call of Duty, Axe Division, uh, read my script. My script was a, a very much an action adventure kind of movie, um, sort of two-hander set in Iraq uh, about private security contractors in 2006, um, very much a sort of run-and-gun sort of military thing uh, that was very intense, very sort of authentic. And um, the Call of Duty, the guys at Sledgehammer, read the script and loved it. And thought, oh, we need to hire this guy to, to uh, to write our, our campaign for our, our Call of Duty that we're, we're bringing out. So there I am being hired to write Call of Duty, which was pretty fantastic. I, I wasn't really a gamer beforehand. As I said, my focus was all on on movies, um, but I loved the idea of it. I mean, who wouldn't? Um, yeah. And uh, you know, working in a in a medium that was new to me, I always liked being I'm very curious about what's possible and what you can do and always looking for the new new frontier, the new horizon. Um, and so uh, that was great. It turned out to be the, the best education I could have had in, in 3D um, gaming, game engines, you know, uh, immersive technologies, um, motion capture, performance capture. I mean, I mean everything. And, and also importantly, I think storytelling through all of that. Um, my focus is always, you know, of course, Call of Duty is a game and it's known for, you know, there's multiplayer stuff. But so I was sort of bringing, trying to bring a lot more sort of story elements to it. And they, they were wanting to make it more like a Hollywood blockbuster movie. You know, that was the sort of emphasis back then on the video games, make it big and sort of, uh, you know, like these sort of Hollywood blockbusters. So so that's why they they hired me. And it was it was a fascinating process uh, of learning for me. Um, of learning about game development, um, all the different processes. And I sort of quickly realized how different those processes are to making movies and the whole culture and uh, emphasis. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, and that kind of set me up for, for where I then went because I, unlike other screenwriters, I think um, they think, oh, no, I just want to do movies. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, I'm, I'm always just very curious about what what else we can do. And and I was just, to be honest, blown away by what I was seeing. I mean, I, I happened to be working on the most cutting edge game at the time and the biggest game. So, you know, what we were doing was, was, you know, the best that it could ever be at that point. So, but I was just thinking this is, I remember, I remember the first day I saw one of the tests of one of the actors and I'd seen it that I'd written it. Was, and, uh, and I was like, oh my God, that just looks like a movie. But always in my mind, I was like, but this is a 3D character that you could walk around and interact with. And it, and it's almost like I have that sort of naivety of the outsider of like seeing the obvious, but seeing it with new eyes, you know, sort of was, that's, that's just amazing. And, and my imagination of, you know, telling stories within that space just was completely sparked. And um, VR was taking off at that time. Um, I mean, after Call of Duty, I actually got hired to write another a game. I was very interested, got very into like, you know, game storytellings, um, The Last of Us. It was come out at about the same time, the first one of those, which was amazing. And I was very into the sort of Telltale Games sort of stuff, um, and Walking Dead and things like that. Um, um, and so I was hired to write another action adventure game in a, in a sort of Telltale vein as well, that that never ended up getting getting made. The company went went under before we did, but we did a lot of good work on that. So I was very interested in the whole branching storylines and just interactivity in, in general and, you know, how... Uh, you know, story plays a part within that, um, and bringing traditional, you know, movie storytelling um, ideas. Uh, see how they worked within a 3D immersive interactive environment. Um, and VR was taking off in a big way, and I was like, okay, this is this is nuts. This is going to be amazing. We're going to step into these scenes and be able to do this stuff. So I, I got very very interested in in that. Um, so and that was our first thing that we really did. I mean, I. 
you know, ended up self-funding a couple of demos. And, you know, this was like 2015, 2016. And, and those demos, like now looking back on it, I mean, they really hold up now. I mean, they're, they're as good as anything that you see now. Um, you know, they were, they were showcased by um, NVIDIA and AMD and HTC Vive as, you know, showing off the technologies of, of VR and stuff. Super cool. Um, in fact, they were what, the two. Um, hmm? what, what technology were, were they using? Was it in Unreal or Unity? This is, or, this is all Unreal. I mean, it, it was kind of that? interesting how all these things coincide because, you know, I don't come from a CG background at all. I don't come from a visual effects background. Um, I come, I guess, from a from a movie writing background and from a sort of game game background, and so you know, game engines. I was like, well, this is great. You know, we should just be working in game engines. You know, and I was very, you know, when I came back to Hollywood, it, it, nobody had really sort of, you know, I guess game engines weren't quite where they are now then, but nobody was interested in game engines, or a few people were in the sort of previous world. You know, at uh, yeah. Third and Halo, and people were were you know getting very excited about that. Um, but you know, I was like, oh, what are we? And then Unreal is like Unreal or Unity, and uh, I was actually working with there's a couple of couple of guys um, who are very few people in Hollywood who are interested in in um, using game engines, um, and so I have to sort of connect with those people because you know when there's only a few people around, you tend to sort of find each other mm. somehow. Um, in fact, bizarrely, so. Kind of all came about through Zoe Saldana, you know, the, the actor Zoe Saldana right. from uh, Avengers and and uh, and, St and Star Trek and Guardians. So Z I knew Zoe, and I actually wrote my Nicole winning script kind of for her in the hope that, well, I know Zoe, I'll write a script for her. That'd be a good move, right? And then it happened to win the Nicole, and then Zoe optioned it, and she was going to produce and star in it. But then, you know, she, I mean, she was already very, you know, big after Avatar and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and she got Guardians of the Galaxy. So we never end up ma making my my movie, but um, it was, you know, after I won the Nico, I was actually, you know, we were talking to her and Jason Chen, who's now head of digital at Braun. Uh, this is back, you know, 20, I don't know, what, 2012, 2013? Yeah. Um, about, you know, making, you know, game engine CG movies, you know, and obviously Zoe had been working on Avatar with, you know, with she's the sort of queen of performance capture at that point. Um, and I was, you know, it was all, all new to me, but uh, I was working on Call of Duty. So it seemed like, oh, this is really, really cool. Um, I mean, nothing quite came of that. I, I don't think we were quite ready for it. And I got super interested in, in VR. Um, and it was all Unreal. I mean, I'm, I jumped into this completely, you know, we, we chose Unreal as the game engine. And I think it proved to be the right choice. Um, and so, you know, I've been working, I've only worked in Unreal and I've been working in Unreal for like five, six years. Um, and it was interesting because when we first started to work um, in VR, you know, I was very interested in digital humans, you know, obviously coming from a story background and movie background, it's kind of like, well, you know, I'm interested in people and performances and relationships and meaning and how people, you know, create that meaning. Um, so I was, you know, very interested in digital human avatars and, and, and a lot of people said, oh, no, you're not going to be able to do, you know, photo real humans in VR. You know? And I'm like, but well, what about this? Like, look at this. Here it is, you know. And I was like, what? You know? <laughs> like, I, it's almost like because we didn't know any better, we were able to pull it off. And, uh, and I, I look at those demos and they're, they're super, super cool. And it also gave us a discipline of working in a medium um, that you had to be super, super efficient and optimized with what you're doing and be super creative about the choices you make and what you're making. Um, because this is not only working in, in, in a game engine, in, in interactive on 2D, you know, it's 3D immersive in VR. So it's almost like the hardest possible mountain to climb to do a photo yeah. of a digital human that, you know, is there. So, but that's what, well, that's what we did. Um, and the first project that I, I self-funded was coming something called Grace, which was uh, I wanted. I thought music would be a, a big important area of, of VR, which it turned out to be. With Beat Saber is kind of saving the world, um, but I wanted to do a music performance in VR, and you know we thought, well, what, what should we do? And so well, let's make a robot with a human face. It's sort of you know we just made creative choices that sort of made that that somewhat possible and she performs on a on a on a single space you know she's performing on this beam of light 
And so Grace, uh, you know, we did Grace. And while we were there, um, you know, people always said to me, well, you know, you're the Call of Duty guy, you know what I mean? Even though, mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't like to necessarily just be, be lumbered as the military guy, but, you know, that's how people perceive you as. Um, and they said, well, you should do something military. And, 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 uh, and of course, I mean, A, I'd written a script that was very, very military based, but then I, I then get hired on Call of Duty and I have like, you know, my technical advisors are, you know, the Delta Force commander who went into Tora Bora in 2001 on the first hunt for bin Laden sort of thing. And, wow. you know, he commanded that mission and he's my technical advisor, you know, and, wow. and then another guy is uh, Mitch Hall, who, um, 20 year Navy SEAL, who, who, um, you know, advised Mark and Catherine on Zero Dark Thirty and, you know, Lone Survivor and all these, all these movies. And, and so then they're, they're available to me to sit down and chat about all this stuff. So, so I kind of have all this like huge knowledge of, you know, uh, uh, of that kind of space. So it, it did make sense to do something with it. I just wanted to do something different. So I decided to do a, a, a reconstruction um, of the uh, Navy SEALs Bin Laden raid in 2012, I guess, May 2nd, 2012, um, of what that mission was. I was talking to some folks who were on that mission and I uh, had a lot of information about that. And I wanted to really see, you know, that mission from all points of view. So basically a high level virtual reality documentary, interactive documentary. Um, so I self-funded a, a demo for that. Um, and I did the, the grace thing and both those, those, uh, experiences I said were seen within the industry and within like, you know, VRLA and around and about, you know, you know, companies took it to different exhibitions. Um, but we didn't manage to do anything more with that. I still hope to. Um, but those two scene files actually are the scene files that just last year I did something called the Real Time Shorts Challenge, where I made those files available to anybody who wanted to use them to basically make make a short film, use it in, in any way you want. So that was a kind of interesting experiment. And so I don't know, my whole career over the last 10 years has sort of been sort of an experiment into what's possible uh, using the technology that, that's available, but very much a hands-on experience. And I say like most of it is unreal, like what can the engine do, what, what it can't do, and then uh, you know, a new, uh, you know, a new version of the Unreal will come out, and then suddenly, oh, we can do hair now. <laughs> it's you know, it was you know, you can spend a year and a half, you know, trying to solve a problem, and then you know, the iPhone X comes out, and it's like, oh, great, okay, we've got some sort of basic sort of you know, facial tracking for that. But um, so yeah, that's that's sort of how it sort of got me into the space, and uh, you know, amazing kind of inadvertently into into games but it's ended up becoming a, a kind of meat of what you've done not in games but <clears throat> but in real time in general yeah and i guess that's defined my career somewhat is is i'm kind of uh if i wanted to earn more money i probably sort of stayed in movies and just be you know cranking out a bunch of war movies i guess but um i kind of always want to go you know where that where an area that i haven't been and i mm. sort of have a sort of you know background i have so you know i'm i'm a i'm a pretty good writer you know but i don't know a lot of things about all these other things so i go and talk to people or i hire people or we you know we, we get we you know we build these teams um you know it's kind of interesting like one of the first things i did um after i did the self-funded the demos because i just wanted to get like visibility like either get some funding or you know get a job from you know and you had to make something right to prove you can do it and uh, one of the first things that came along, so I, I, uh, I knew um, Harry Shearer's manager. So Harry Shearer, you know, does half the voices on The Simpsons and yeah. Spinal Tap. You probably remember that being, being British. Of course. Yeah. Um, so Harry had long time wanted to do a satirical um, political weekly TV show um every week so like spitting image you'll remember that from england like spitting images yeah. like weekly you know they use puppets you know with, with the politicians you know and, and it'd be written every week so it'd be you know um like um like what's his name uh, oliver um you know just sort of weekly update and and he wanted to then you know play puppet digitally all of those characters so harry gave me a budget and we made trump and obama this is bearing in mind before trump was elected so you know harry so and this was so it it was kind of cool because um i'd met um uh cubic uh gareth edwards 
and Amy Davis at Cubic uh, when they did Seagraph Live with Ninja Theory and they, they won Seagraph Laugh Live, that was like 2015, 2016. And so I thought, well, let's, let's get them. I hired them and built this team to build this, basically this test for Harry. Um, we built the, the Trump and Obama characters and got Cubic. So I was working with Cubic, Ninja Theory and Epic Games come on board because this was like, oh, real time, like this is the first real time thing that they they'd been you know doing i mean you know cubic had just done the the senua um piece with ninja um and so this looked like a good thing like to, to make a tv show that you could literally turn around within a couple of days you know kind of shoot live live real time you know that was that was the that was the high ambition um and we we did it it was it was you know we put it out like three days after after um after we shot it and it was it was very strange because it was literally we put it out the day after um trump was elected the election had happened and that was a little bit of a shock to us and and so the actual scene that we created um was a hypoth at that point a hypothetical conversation of obama showing trump around the the oval office having won the election and it's like this little exchange between the two of them it's, that Harry had, uh, had, uh, had, had written. And so it was incredibly prescient because that's actually what happened. Like literally what we had just made was then on the news with Obama showing <laughs> Trump into the Oval <laughs> Office. So, um, so yeah, so I've been working with those folks and, you know, you know, um, building those relationships with them for a long time. And this was before Cubic was bought by Epic and, and, and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, a while back. So um, I don't know. So I've been in real time uh, a while, I guess, you know, uh, and especially with with Epic, and and it's been nice to see Epic's fortunes rise. Um, you know, uh, I, I think they're doing a, a fantastic job in creating what this is. You know, and uh, yeah, and 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 it's and I think it's it's always important to remember that it's kind of been down to a piece of content, a piece of content called Fortnite. You know, um, there's all this emphasis on the technology. Um, this game engine, that game engine, this this whatever. Um, that's kind of been what's been driving investment is is to find a piece of technology that they can in, invest in. But for me, um, and also as a writer, as a creative, it 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 all comes down to the creative. And I think you know that's sort of interesting. The epic success is really down to a lot to to Fortnite and what that's been able to generate. But and that piece of content, you know, because it's a way of something becoming real and tangible within the world. You know, they've got something like 350 million users. And this is the portal to the metaverse. This is, you know, Tim yeah. Sweeney, he's, he's doing it. You know, he's, he's building it. This, uh, yeah, is, this, is, sure. this is actual. This is real. There's a real economy. There's real money. There's real participation of people. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 it's wonderful to see this, this blossoming, really. And what they've been able to do, and also you know, just fun stuff for people. You know, the, the, yeah. the culture of creativity and innovation that they've been able to to build from this is 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 just fantastic. It's unprecedented, you know, um, to be. That's you know, the right say, word. I've I've yeah. been I've been on the receiving end of some mega grants. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. And you know, it's um, they're building it. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot to to uh, be grateful for and to praise epic for for what they're doing and what they're continuing to i mean i'm talking to them now because they're doing certain er certain things i mean obviously you know I, i'm super interested in doing movies um and i can't say too much about it but um um you know i can say what you know publicly they, they've said i mean they you know they hired jason mcgatlin who's the former executive producer of the star wars movies and the mandalorian um earlier this year and um and you know there's there's talk of a, a fortnite movie so so mm. they're making interesting moves you know in the right direction and, and making some significant hires to do that um and i think that's right because you know you've got gaming on one side you know they've got they've got that down um yeah. and i think different forms of content whether it's movies games xr whatever these are these are all just portals into what will be called the metaverse if we hopefully won't Probably. overuse that word too much but <laughs> yeah you know, there are all different ways of, of of coming at the same thing you know and and that's where that's one of my goals in in all of this is i realize well you know i love movies i know i know movies i know hollywood i know the industry and i now you know know 3d game engines so it makes sense for for me to be at this point where we're actually making a, a 2d linear thing that will then become a 3d immersive 
you know, gaming experience, but using basically all the same assets, which is the sort of the vision we've had for a long, long time, but it, it is truly becoming a reality right now. And I think uh, everybody's yeah. kind of seeing that happen. Yeah, it's amazing. I see, uh, um, and Has, who was on the last podcast, was talking about that as he's developing that the game and uh, film together. And yeah, it's amazing to watch that happen. Something which I, I don't know, was curious about while we were making The Lion King, we we're making this whole movie in a game engine. No one's ever going to see that. Can't we do something else with it? Obviously, you can't, but we, we couldn't then. But yeah. I really hope that um, people do uh, now think about that more from the beginning and and because there's there's so much work that goes into that stuff there's so much creativity and, and so all these assets that exist that you can bust this open and not just have it be a one-way street but have people interacting with storage i know you know a lot about coming from being being a writer and in games especially games like as, as big as the ones you've worked on um and put in, and and knowing you as much as I do, knowing that you wanted to really push that medium and and uh, see what's possible, it must be a really exciting time for you to now be at this moment where those two things are colliding in the way that they are. They're not they're, they're not so separate. You now mentioning, well, you know, I, I I hope so. I mean, it's still you know you go and talk to a traditional filmmakers or studios or you know when it becomes real is when people are just accepting this as, as normality at the moment it is still yeah. like science fiction to most people because yeah you know you i and your audience here are probably well versed in all of these things and the possibilities of what's happening and it's just like what is but to a lot of people this still all sounds and feels like like what like science fiction you know and yeah. so they don't really believe it or they're also kind of threatened by it there's you know that you know this is Thing that I've learned in my career is I'm always like, what's new and what's innovation? And actually, any industry doesn't really want new innovation. You know, they want to basically yeah. create something that makes a lot of money and keep squeezing that and squeezing it and squeezing it. They don't want to change. They don't want innovation because there's a sort of um, relationship to power that is created in any in any structure. So when anything comes along that disrupts that a piece of technology or a piece of content, um, inevitably it's going to rub certain people up the wrong way yeah. or uh, a lot of people who have a vested interest in the way things are um, are going to resist it. And they're generally the ones in powers and the decision makers. So it's a sort of, uh, you know, that's why it's kind of interesting with Epic's position because they don't really occupy one area. You know, they're not a movie studio. I mean, they're a game studio kind of, you know, but but it's not, um, you know, they're, they're, and, uh, you know, and their, their, their basis, their MO is they're not, invested in what is or what has been they're very much invested in the future so all, all of their moves um are, are based around that whereas you know when entering the movie industry you come into a very established way of doing things it's it's like trying to sort of you know steer the titanic away from the iceberg or whatever because it's it's just uh you realize there's just all this inertia of, of the way things are and i think yeah, it's um, like it, they can't really come from within that same beast yeah. kind of has to come from the outside well it kind of isn't isn't you know that's, that's the thing because of course the industry is always changing and evolving uh you know it's amazing how the whole mandalorian scenario even you know the lion king as you said like suddenly you know that's all you know in previous it's coming through previous you know and and uh it's like well what if the previous is as good as the movie you know it's um it's sort of happening from within too um but I think the real interesting stuff is going to happen from outside. And that's almost what I've been interested in. I'm, I'm always been interested in like cutting edge and sort of the slightly sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of more risky or dangerous or experimental kind of area. You know, I think where that's, you know, in, in any culture, that's where the good stuff is. Uh, and then that's what really sparks change and innovation. And then suddenly something gets a bit of, you know, lands, gets a bit of success. And then that's that sort of style or thing is appropriated by the sort of more established powers. But um, and that's one of the things that I'm super excited about, because I sort of learned in my career as a writer is, is, you know, you get successful, you get you get to a point where, oh, you're a writer now, you're a Hollywood screenwriter. And then they just want you to do the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. So I had done, you know, a, a award winning movies, uh, you know, war script. I've worked on Call of Duty. So everything that I was up for and everything that I was pitching on was based around kind of, you know, special forces or, or whatever, which is fine. I mean, I could totally do that. 
but uh, that's what you kind of become and you don't that you know that's okay you know that's all you're going to do or it feels like that um so the the fact of coming in with a new technology a new way of doing things that co- totally rewrites the script on what you can do uh and the type of content that you can make um and for the for the money as well um you know that's super super exciting to me i i kind of want to be I don't want to be working in an area where I know everything, where everything's like a known quantity. I really like working at like, well, what if we put this in with this and what happens? And what if we get this person to come and do this? And, you know, it's like that's that's what's interesting to me. And then finding finding the gold within that and trying to trying to make that work. Because uh, I don't know, I, I like that sort of problem solving and, and team building, team building. It's a lot, it's so much about people, as you know, like any production is really about people. So any business is a people business, as uh, somebody once said to me, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have a couple of questions that are coming in from people listening. Um, uh, one is, how, how do you use, um, or do you use Unreal Engine to help you with pitching film concepts, previews, storyboards, etc.? cetera? Um, not really. Because, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's more, you know, again, for me, you know, I'm 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 a writer, and as, as a filmmaker, it sort of is about the script and the story, uh, in a funny kind of way. Although I'm sort of heavily immersed, excuse the pun, in in the technology. You know, for me, the technology is just a means to tell the story and to reach an audience. Um, yep. So it's always sort of secondary, and and it's funny because my, the biggest hurdle. Um, you know, I've got a slate of nine movies that I put together that I could, you know, make, you know these are all unreal unreal movies and a couple of the projects of my scripts but you know other 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 scripts that have been you know were on the blacklist or other nickel winners have got you know scripts on their shelf that they were and i thought well how can we repurpose this and you know to make it with a game engine um but the, the biggest hurdle is still like oh okay you know we want to see if you've got like a three minute reel of it and the thing is when you when you're pitching a movie is really really hard anyway like seems almost impossible. You know, I spent a whole career in Hollywood of writing movies that don't get made. It's just the sort of reality of it. Um, so, and then you're sort of pitching this, a, a movie and you're pitching a new pipeline, a way of making that movie and what that looks like that they don't know and they're not mm. familiar with and they're not, you know, okay with. It's not been established. It's not been proven, you know? Even yeah. though, I mean, I can point that, oh, The Lion King, you know? Yeah, uh, Disney's biggest movie and blah blah blah. You know what I mean? But it's it doesn't it doesn't compute necessarily. And of course, I mean that's a different sort of equation to you know a bunch of you know indie devs getting together and, and making a movie. You know, but um, you know so the so always they ask is well if, you know could, if you could make a, a two or three minute video of this you know uh, you know to show us how it looked like. I'm kind of, well, I could, but that would still, you know, it's like, as you know, the first minute of anything is the most expensive because, you know, you still have to create all those assets for that three minutes, whether you use it for three minutes or, or, or 60 minutes or, or hour, you know, hour and a half. Um, so um, that's why Epic, I think, is, is pretty interesting because they can now be funding these shorts. And it's been very interesting, all of the innovation that's been coming out of the Unreal Fellowships and, and you know, the requirement to, like, make a, make a little short. Um, now those are very, you know, turned around very quickly. Um, and so, you know, we don't get the full, um, sense of what we could make, but, uh, we've seen a, you know, a bunch of shorts recently that, that certainly visually, you know, the Aaron Sims one recently, I mean, they're, they're, they're fantastic, you know, and, and, um, and that's what, what, we're, what we're doing, you know, is to actually prove it. So that, you know, to answer your question, you kind of have to prove, prove what it is. So even doing previous, I mean, it's interesting because previous came about because visual effects became so expensive and these, you know, $200 million movies, you know, so let's, let's have a form that we can show and design and sort of, so that we can sort of sign off on these shots, basically. That's why previous comes into existence to sort of save the cost of that iteration and innovation in the production. So previous becomes a thing what, you know, 15, 20, 10 years ago, whenever, whenever previous uh, sort of, it taken off uh, but it still doesn't prove the product you know um in in the way that the studio would say well if we're making a movie now unreal they, they want to kind of see it they just want to see it and they honestly there's, there's nothing better than seeing it to believe it people just go oh there it is you know um yeah. you know uh, it, almost like sometimes if you're 
just using it as previs and you're you know chucking a couple of meta humans in there and a little bit of janky mocap it almost it almost goes against it because it just it just confirms you know because they're right. not they're not i was going to say sophisticated but they are sophisticated <laughs> they're just not familiar with you know okay if you look at this and i i've done this many times with clients clients if if you give them something that isn't sort of really polished and special they just see the flaws and they just think oh it, 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 it activates that sort of lizard part of their brain where yeah. people get very scared. I mean, you probably yes. every, every CG, every CG person has, I know. It's not yeah. like you can say, well, this is the sort of previous, you know what I mean? But so this is how, you know, you, yeah. there's just nothing imagine. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't fly. You've got to just sort of show it. And that's why, yeah. um, you know, it's great epic funded our David Bowie stuff. I mean, it, it's it's like, you know, you need a bit of budget to, to sort of prove it. But when you prove it, you're like, oh, oh, fuck. That's like, that's 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 it you know and the same but even the same with you know telling a story um and there are very certain things that are considerations you know if you're using digital characters instead of uh, live action characters you've got to you've got to know how you can get that performance but that, then you, i mean that's why i think i'm kind of quite well placed in that I, I know story i know performance i know what engines possible i know what a digital characters possible so you've kind of you know it is this strange alchemy that you've got to put in and, and that's what we're, we're really wanting to prove is a is an emotional performance of a just a really good story that people the, the technology becomes invisible and you're just like oh that's a, that's a cracking character and i really connect with that character and that's a great story um so you know I don't know what your original question was. <laughs> so, Do you use Unreal Engine to help with pitching the film? And essentially, you, you did, yeah, you did answer that very well. I mean, so yeah, but I mean, not, even not even, so to, even even to Epic, you know, I mean, they're like, well, have you got some kind of build to show us? You know, I mean, at some level, yes, of course it does. Um, you know, it it depends on who it depends, it depends on who you're talking to. Is I guess what what I'm saying. If yeah. you're talking to somebody who understands what they're looking at, then that can obviously be a huge huge help. Um, and there are a whole bunch of people that you need to prove this to uh, in order to get people on board, get people involved. Um, but in terms of actually selling a movie, because it's one thing to sell like, oh, this is a little previous thing for this idea. It's st that's still just one part of what the buy-in is to buy in on a, on a movie or a TV show or something. There's so many more bigger considerations than just the sort of, you know, the visual effects. So, yeah. No, so yes no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Depends. Depends who your who your yeah. audience is. Know know your audience. And and like you mentioned with the things like Lion King and Jungle Book, where some of this stuff came through, yeah. they were <clears throat> nobody ever saw the the real time stuff. It was very useful in the filmmaking process, but they kind of de-risked it by sliding it into something that's already known. Like they pretty much knew the Lion King as long as they didn't mess it up. <clears throat> it was an unknown quantity. They would yeah. they, the risk that whole massive chunk so they could afford to take this little bit of risk here it wasn't the entire thing it wasn't a new story plus this plus yeah. what the audience is going to see which is too much for uh sometimes for exec producers to start. well and with the lion king girls still saw this pushback of like oh it looks too real or and all these all these things and the I'm final, like, well, yeah. just look at the numbers guys <laughs> you know i mean yeah. it, it killed it i mean it was fantastic and i i i thought it was a fantastic movie and um I didn't have those. You know, there's the thing. There's, there's always going to be naysayers. There's always naysayers within. Oh yeah. Those it's it's um it's something that I, I especially when you're using digital humans, everybody goes like, ah, oh, uncanny valley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like the easiest put down of of anything, and and it does, and it's just it's just not helpful, you know, because uncanny valley is basically just a matter of perception and i and you know who's your audience you know my my, my nine-year-old son is is a, is a great audience i use him as the metric all the time for stuff because he's he's 3d immersive digital native you know that's, that's he just he just takes this all for granted so you know and that's just becoming, becoming more and more and more so a lot of the pushback comes from and again that's the nature of the industry you know film you know it's like well what does film look like what does it feel like what are people expect and they're always measuring it by something that i was gonna say literally doesn't exist anymore i mean it does exist film but but you know people didn't believe that that digital would take over from film right up until you know kodak went bankrupt you know, in 2029 yeah. or whenever that was so i don't know I, I i don't have any of that resistance you know and people sort of say oh it looks gamey i'm like 
games are great <laughs> right yeah and your audience is like it looks like a game that's fantastic that's awesome i mean there obviously you know there are certain circumstances and certain stories that you don't want it to look gamey but it doesn't have to i i don't know i you know there there are plenty of areas where um where this is going to be really really amazing stuff and, and we're we're building that reality that's what we're trying to do and the yeah the technology is evolving it was such a I think almost now that the past the knee of the curve in the exponential growth of it, like <clears throat> we're starting to see it change so fast that I can imagine, I can't imagine it, what's going to be possible in a year. It's really hard to project that, but we know we can see that it's progressing forwards very well, fast. Well, it's interesting. I kind of have a, you know, when you're, there's a lot of emphasis on what's new and what's out, what's out now. Oh, it's UE5, you know what I mean? Like everything. Mm. And I'm kind of like, like I said earlier about the VR pieces that we made five years ago with Unreal, you know, that was all real time. That was all we were like, the, the best card out of the time was an NVIDIA 1080. So everything was sort of benchmarked there in VR and it looked amazing. You know, we had to be creative. And of course, yeah, I'm working with Cubic, I'm working with Ninja, I'm working with Epic, but you know, so that's not available to everybody, but it's also there are so many more people around now doing it. I I, I kind of want to demythologize it a little bit because I think you know I really like what you're doing. I mean, you're 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 getting their hands in technology. So look, you can do this. Yeah, go and do it. You know, come and come and create it. I I don't, you know, you know everybody should be a decent. That's Epic's mo too. I mean, you know, this bringing out MetaHumans and Quixel and buying all these companies that and making it available suddenly it's just free and available so but i think what we really need though is a culture of people and creatives who are actually actively building stuff and exploring and telling stories and and making stuff so you know it, it you know i don't really get so excited now about well what's what's the next next release um, i'm more or more like okay well what can somebody make with this stuff so i want to see what people are making it doesn't, you know, it's it's like, you know, 4.25 or 6, you know what I mean? Like, I'm totally happy working in in 2.6, you know, um, or 2.7, I guess, just just um, yes. uh, come out now. But, um, um, you know, and it's good. It's good to have that excitement about UE5 and all the rest of it. But um, the tools are amazing already, you know. Yeah. They've been amazing for a long time. And, and, and in a way, I think there's this, it's wrong to, really emphasize what's next i mean that's kind of the marketing <laughs> you know that's because you're selling more product you're selling more gpus or you're selling whatever but the 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 uh the strength of the industry is based on what people actually make with this stuff and uh you know creating an audience for this stuff and so you know we need to be making movies you know and and it's not like oh yeah that was made with ue5 no it's just like oh it's on netflix you know amazon's you know front page and comes up and you don't even think about how it's made whether that's ue5 or, or whatever you know it's just a cracking good movie and a cracking good piece of entertainment you know um so i i mean again that's why you know the, the mega grant stuff's been great the fellowship stuff's been great i i want to see it taken to the next level though and that's what we're 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 doing um it's like in the next little while we should have fully fledged feature films that are that um that prove what what this can be and and that's that that's what i want to be doing and uh it takes a lot of different people coming from different areas uh you know there's you know, CG people, there's writers, there's directors, you know, getting traditional directors on board who can really understand what this is. Um, producers understanding what the new different workflows, uh, you know, pipelines, uh, opportunities for creating efficiencies within that. I think that's, that's massive, you know, really proving how you make a movie, not just what you make, but how the process is like, you know, when you, you know, using game development, you know, workflows rather than traditional movie workflows, you know, it's, it's got to really, really lean into what the engine is, which is, a, it's, a, it's a game engine. So what does, what is that really good at? And if you understand that and understand how to make a movie and you can build that up from the ground up, I think that's where we're going to see some super, super exciting stuff and a lot of very interesting films and a lot of, uh, I mean, I say films, I feel like cool, metaverse movies, you know, because they're, you know, a movie made within a game engine is already more than a movie. Um, so, you know, it'll be, you know, movies that can very easily cross over. Like I say, very easily cross over. There's nothing very easy about any, <laughs> of it, any of it. But you've laid the foundation of this, you know, you know, UE, UE5 or UE4, 
uh, this is this is the this is the operating system of the metaverse. So there it is. You know, um, we just need more more content, really, more rather than you know more people making yeah. really good stuff that proves it to an audience beyond the technology. That's what I want to see. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's um, I think what uh, VR suffered from a little bit in the last five or so years was having a real emphasis on the technology and really struggling to find yeah. its feet content wise. And there's well, that's yeah, what happened. You know, we made this amazing VR stuff five years ago. And what happened is this huge emphasis. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, Silicon Valley is, you know, a, a blessing and a curse because it sort of comes in with investment and they just want to see what the, what the biggest scalable thing is. And there's all this hype. Hype can be good and hype can be bad. You know, there's all this yeah. hype about what VR could be. And yet it's still, you know, there is no real user base. You know, it's all very tentative. It's evolving. Um, and so there's all this investment goes into, oh, VR is the future, VR is the future. And then within two years, all these companies that had attracted all this investment went bust. And from the investment perspective, you know, VR was death. Like you couldn't mention that you were making VR, you know, right. yeah. which, which yeah. is bizarre. And then it became an like AR. Oh, you can, you can mention AR, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. but, um, and so I, honestly, I mean, you know, everybody hates on Facebook for probably good reasons, but, but Zuckerberg has been, you know, he sparked this, this revolution by the uh, Oculus acquisition and he's consistently been pumping money into it and, and creating a product. I mean, yeah, you know, I like the high-end VR stuff because I think that's where we where we can do the most interesting stuff. But it's a complete um, truth to, you know, pivot to be doing the quest and build that whole ecosystem out um, and and commit to that and commit to that because it is the future. You know, or, you know, and listen to Tim Sweeney, listen to Zuckerberg. I listen mm. to Sweeney more than Zuckerberg. But, but, yeah, same here. <laughs> um, but I appreciate um, both of them. Like you say, you know, they yeah. really do. They both. It's all important. It's important to have that. The, the mix of <clears throat> lots of money and these big <clears throat> and, 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 the, and the vision, you know, yeah. um, and I think Fortnite modeling is really done. Is it was already really, really done that in terms of opening yeah. up content, opening up entertainment, you know, it's suddenly it's fun. It's a game, but it's kind of everything, you know, and that's what the metaverse is. I mean, that's what, you know, Tim's obviously trying to do. Uh, and, and it makes complete sense, you know. You've got a massive user base. You got you can just grow out from that that equation. Um, makes I loved his um, yeah, totally. I, I loved his recent talk on the metaverse. I really liked his perspective on it. It was very thorough and I don't know, kind of science driven. Um, yeah, but it was very very practical, and it was yeah. really. I think <clears throat> the epic culture is unlike one I've I've seen in almost any company in any yeah. industry that i've been in it's really unique and it's really like it, yeah none of this could have happened without it most companies well it's, it's also real and tangible he's actually building like everybody else talking about the metaverse we just sort of laugh and go like you know yeah sure right you know but tim sweeney's doing it like fortnite exists yeah. you know the meta the, even the fact we're talking about the metaverse only really we're only talking about it because of fortnite if we think about it you know it, it, it it's it's tangible it's a massive economy you know epic epics you know pulling in what four or five billion dollars a year on i mean that <laughs> life culture goes where the money is and the the commerce and and this is this is solid solid money it, it's not a sort of uh, a unicorn startup that doesn't actually have a revenue model you know what i mean it it, it isn't a sort of you know inflated um evaluation it's 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 real it's people you know uh you know consuming them and that's why for me i i know all the sort of you know investment culture it, you know i i come from entertainment i come from building stuff i build, come from telling stories and for me that's that's where real value is when people have relationships to pieces of um entertainment or pieces of art whatever you want to call it um that is meaningful to them and that they're willing to um, give it their attention or give it their attention and their money. Um, that's, that's real and tangible. You know, there, there's a lot of hype and inflation. And I, I really believe that in order to like with VR to, to have a sustainable business, it has to be, it has to be real. You know, we have to be ha having a real economy from, from this and create. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I, I wish they'd put more money that that investment money, um, that they put into bricks and mortar and to dubious technology. I wish they'd put it into content creators. 
because it's, yep. it's content creators that actually really propagate the value of this stuff. Um, it's not about, as I said, like come back to like, it's not about like, oh, UE5, that's the answer. No, the answer is actually making stuff that people find meaningful and, and, and pleasure, pleasurable. That kind of leads well into another question that jumped in here, which is what are the best ways to monetize real-time short films currently? Interesting question. I, I think short, short, I mean, short films have never been monetizable really. I mean, so, it, you know, short films have always been a, a calling card or a proof of concept of something more. Um, and that's partly why I've sort of returned to movies because, you know, I went through VR, I went through all of that sort of, you know, um, ups and downs and, and AR and stuff. And, but what it comes down to, you know, and, and during this whole period of the last 10 years, just the success of Netflix and then the pandemic, you know, sort of propelled that further. People watch a lot of content. They watch a lot of 2D linear content. It's a massive, massive industry. Um, so, you know, making, making 2D content, whatever pipeline you've got, is, is probably a good idea if you like, if you like making stuff. Um, so, you know, short films in themselves, I mean, that's, that's always, it's always this tricky, you know, situation, you know, they have to, I think, prove something more than what they are. Um, I don't think they're monetizable in themselves. I mean, that's why, you know, the, the Unreal Fellowship stuff, it's like, okay, that's a good little concept, you know, and then, but then, you know, have they got, have they got a script for a feature or a limited series or a episodic, you know, what, what is the, you know, again, it, it kind of comes again back to beyond just the technology and the pipeline and the means of making it. It, it steps into the realm of like, well, how, how does anything make money? And that's, that's the same question for anything. Um, it's kind of interesting. I was, you know, thinking about, you know, Squid Game on Netflix, mm. which I loved. I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a Korean, it's a Korean uh, um, TV show. So the innovation is kind of new and different because it was developed outside of the, you know, the Western world. Um, bring something new to the equation. But it was also interesting how, you know, that as a piece, you know, what if, you know, what if that had been made in, in a game engine? I mean, it's interesting that already now, because of its success, people start like, oh, the Squid Game game, you know, um, Mr. Beast just the other day, like did a whole Squid Game thing that they used Unreal for, for you know, within a, in, a, um, in, in a hybrid sense, you know, um, to create, you know, recreate Squid Game. People who are making VR games of Squid Game. So it, it's almost like the culture is, is crying out for this anyway. So I think, you know, as soon as a piece of content, like a movie, or a game, you know, uh, well, so movies made with a game engine, then, well, there you go. There's the VR experience as well. There's the playable game of that thing. It already exists. You know, it's not like a sort of, you know, uh, an extension of it. And and like IPs like Squid Game, um, you know, they're, 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 they're ripe for, and this is, I mean, this is what's fascinating about any, any cultural product these days, any IP is how it exists across these different um, forms. Um, and of course, you know, if you make something in a game engine, it's already metaverse native, you know, it, it's already primed for the metaverse, um, if we want to use that term. <laughs> um, you know, it's already there. So it, it's, in, it's for me, it's inevitably the future. Um, and we just need to be getting out there and making stuff and people need, to, you know, investors need to be less afraid of investing in stuff. Studios need to be less afraid of, of taking risk with something. And you know, there's there's an audience out there for it. If it's good, anything that's good, a good a good short, a good feature, a good anything good is going to get an audience. You know, bad content is bad content, whether it's made with a game engine or not. So, you know, it's just about making good good product. Amazing. Yeah, no, somewhat related um, is somebody's asking what the fundamental skills somebody should have to make films in real time. So I think you've already covered that. Well, uh, kind of, but it's, it, it's yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I come from where I come from. You know, I think every, what's exciting about it is everybody comes generally from some other space and brings what, you know, a bit of that into this new space. And we get to have this wonderful conversation of like, how do we do this? Um, and everybody brings a little bit of expertise and a little bit of open-mindedness. And that that's that's a wonderful combination. Um I would say, I don't know, it's interesting with, with movies because a lot of the people, you know, come from a sort of visual effects kind of background. And, 
it's interesting because you know when you're working with a game engine you're working with a, a game engine that is is fundamentally its own thing it comes from 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 gaming so i don't know i mean i think i think from a sort of game dev kind of background um they they obviously lean into what the engine is you know more um so i i don't i don't know i mean i it's my question i'd put to you uh, edward because you know you obviously are dealing with a whole bunch of folks who are you know wanting to come in and use unreal and they come from all sorts of backgrounds what's what's your experience with that what, what do you think thanks well the first question i've had on, on the podcast in <laughs> this direction i like it um uh yeah it's a good question i was going to say earlier actually it's been an amazing experience um having this school i think originally we thought it was going to be a lot of people wanting to get into the industry and we found a real mix a lot of people are actually already filmmakers and a lot of people who haven't had a 3d background people who've, who've not had the time to spend two years learning maya to be able yeah. to play in 3d and, and sketch their ideas and be able to um, put cameras down and change lights and those kinds of things which are tremendously useful to people so um yeah i think seeing those people coming through has really made me realize what a special time we are in because now within our courses are eight weeks long the regular classes are and then seeing what people can do from nothing to the end of eight weeks producing a short film and learning as much as they do and being productive and then even within that time frame talking about how it's affecting their workflow and yeah. in a positive way it's amazing amazing to see how possible that is and i think what it makes me feel is that you should lean into I think similar to what you've said a bit, leaning into what you're already good at and passionate about, more particularly bringing that into this area. Because I think learning the tools now is is there's a lot less barriers to entry now. And I think really understanding what which part of it you're passionate about. Are you yeah. like are you passionate about the storytelling side, really leaning into that, um, or are you really passionate about the tech itself and developing? Uh, helping other people making stories are you really into making things and building characters well, I, I think people? that's key actually uh, Edward it's interesting uh, you know I've always found this I remember when I was working on Call of Duty and be working with the level designers and they were super passionate and super engaged and had all these ideas about the story about all these things that that weren't necessarily in their realm but you know and I think anybody who even gets into visual effects or, or our game director, they're super passionate about making something and yet the yeah. industry then sort of shoehorn them into a job a position a particular specialized skill and it's sort of like you know that passion is always seems to get cut out or put aside and they just want you to function as this is this unit and i think I've, I've always really wanted to harness people's passions and what you know when i when i meet people and when i work i, I might ask them well, what do you want to do what are you really interested in and harnessing that i think is also key you know rather than seeing people uh, as technicians or as button pushers or whatever you know they're they're an integral part of the creative process of all of this and, and once mm -hmm. you you know, you cast people, you build a team around that, uh, you can create amazing, amazing things. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, I think every part of it is creative. People always describe creativity as something that's creating a, a visual piece or a, a music, something that you can actually consume. But every person in that process is in engaging creativity and combining yeah. things in new ways is really what creativity is and yeah. every part of it is important i totally and, agree and it almost like you know when you've got these massive entities like a big studio bit like i can call it you've got 300 people on the floor it's almost like yeah. inevitable that it becomes like a machine um so I, I i'm a big fan of trying to keep teams small and intimate mm -hmm. um you know you know i think you just get get better results if you can kind of scale it to, to a human level and I think everybody enjoys that more as well. You know, it's um, I, I totally agree. Cool. It's interesting. So I, I did something last year called the Real Time Shorts Challenge, which came about after a conversation. Well, after doing a bit of work with Matt Workman, who some of you will know, or a lot of you will know, yeah. Matt Workman's a you know virtual production guru. Um, I loved his stuff, and I, I um, I, I had these scene files, um, the the, the VR scene files from Grace and the, the Bin Laden piece, and 
and I wanted to just, you know, people to see them, to use them. And, and so I, talking to him, I said, well, could you do anything with this? You know, could you create a scene? And so he he took them and, you know, did a whole piece on, on it. And, and I thought, well, that's really great. And I got a really positive response. And Matt did a fantastic job, you know, just with the assets that, that I gave him. And I thought, well, what if I gave this to anybody who wanted to do it? And so within a couple of weeks, I came up with the idea for the Real-Time Shorts Challenge. And this is before the, the Unreal Fellowship Shorts had come out and anything that happened. happened. So, and again, it comes down to, well, giving people high-level assets that they can play around with. And I got amazing. I had 30 short films in 30 days. And, uh, and the winners, uh, and it was very fascinating, the different diversity of people that came and actually used this, either to learn Unreal and then produce something that was amazing, um, and the diversity of where they came from, you know, different experiences. And in fact, the two guys that, that won, uh, Luke and Kevin, they're, they're, they're short. Uh, they were traditional, um, I think they'd done a little bit of, you know, visual effects and stuff, but they hadn't used Unreal before. But they were essentially live action DPs. And they ended up wanting the Real Time Shorts Challenge with their piece because they had a really good understanding of lighting, of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Just, I think the whole, their whole short is only like five shots. But the way they did it, the way they lit it, the way they said it, you know, they told a story very, very simply with the assets. They utilized the assets uh, in a very, very good, simple, efficient way. But I say, like, they, they cracked open Unreal to do the challenge, you know. Um, and so it's amazing the results that they could get, you know. And I, I, I love that sense of just getting your hands dirty and getting in there and making something, you know. So Yeah, cool. absolutely. Very creative, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, having that permission to do it, I think, is one of the things I've I've noticed as well. When people come in, especially if they're coming from visual effects, but also from filmmaking, so everybody got into it wanting to make their own stuff, but they ended up making a bunch of stuff for other people, and then now being able to like having permission to come back and spend a couple of months to actually make something that they want without any fear of a of any kind really that it's going to be judged or that it's supposed to be productive in some way for this outcome it's just what they want to do and what they want to make having that freedom is a it's a i i it's a privilege for me to be able to watch that watch people do that and, and see what they come up with it's, yeah i mean honestly i think this is going to be like a renaissance of creativity i think uh you know, it's funny how systematized everybody comes, you know, when they're working for an industry, how conservative everything becomes when there's a lot of money and when it costs a lot of money, you know. Um, and so, you know, getting getting the means of production back in the hands of the people, um, I think uh, inevitably is going to be interesting. And it, it, it's funny, it sort of, it, then it comes back to, again, story, what you do with it. It's about what you, okay, you can do this but what 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 is the story what is the thing that you're going to make and because you you can be a bit more experimental you're going to be more experimental and you're going to find that those you know the, the trouble is with experimentation is that, that it's it's um it's kind of expensive because you don't know what the results going to be but it's absolutely essential for any healthy evolving creative interesting medium you know you, you know, otherwise you just it's you know it, rinse wash and repeat you know and and we, we kind of get that you know um quite a lot these days so um no i'm i'm super interested to see what you know what we can do what i can do within the space because i i know i you know we all know what's possible um we just got to get on there and, and, and have the opportunity to make stuff you know and and to fail you know with you know failures failures part of that but uh yeah i, I think i truly think that the next big ip if we're talking IP, the next big art, you know, Star Wars or Fast and the Furious or or anything like that, or, or Marvel, you know, universe. It is it, it, it's going to come out of it's going to be been made with a game engine. Um, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, I think that's super exciting. I think it's 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 inevitable. Amazing. Well, what a great uh, thought <clears throat> to to end on. I'm. I would love it if you uh, if you have anything that you um, want to share uh, in terms of how people could follow you or find out more about what you're up to. Um, if you well, so I guess like so. I, I've got a uh, as probably a lot of your audience will know. I started a, a Facebook group uh, 18 months ago called the Real Time Filmmakers because I, I kind of uh, 
you know, there wasn't the community that existed. And I, I thought, well, I, I have to create the community that I want to be part of. And I, and I, it's, it's sort of, you know, grown. We've got I don't know, like 9,000 members now. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can join real, real time filmmakers. Um, you can follow me, John McInnes. Uh, you can follow my company, McInnes Studios, on uh, all the usual social media channels. Um, yeah, and also, you know, I mean, hit me up, DM me. You know, if you've got if you've got an interesting project, um, I, I like connecting with people and seeing what people are up to. Um, I don't really have much time to read read a lot of scripts, but um, it, it's always nice being on the radar of what people are doing. And, and and encouraging and helping and, and and you know people to do that so amazing no you have a generous spirit and um thank you very much for extending that to us and, and being on here and having this great conversation and uh offering that that great offer to our listeners and yeah um thank you Thanks great being no, it's been my, it's been my pleasure thank you edward and, and jackie um getting the word out it's good absolutely well yeah thank you uh, and thank you to our listeners uh, for joining us here. We'll be back on and again in a couple of weeks. Um, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel. This will be published in, in a week. Um, and also follow us at www.becomestgpro.com if you'd like to know any more about what we're up to. But um, yeah, thank you to everybody. And yeah, this was awesome.